the first part of the presentation and then Lars, I hope well known for all of you, the fire nerd, the Swedish fire nerd with the nice movies. He will take over and uh, tell you about his practical experience, I think, because he didn't know what exactly he was going to tell. So, I will talk okay. about Swedish. Uh, okay, we will just have to, <laughs> and, uh, please make it interactive so you can ask questions, you can discuss, that's, that's the idea. So. I don't know, because the bell went. Do we need to wait or we just uh, start? Uh, I think we can start. Yeah. We already started, of course. Are we? <laughs> <laughs> we are in the house, you see. So oh, yeah, yeah. You're in the house, so yeah. now we can start. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. And um, um, I see some people are uh, entering, uh, no problem. Have a seat. Um, my name is Thijs Geertsema. I uh, recently switched uh, jobs, so I'm now working at uh, the fire department of Twente, but uh, I used to work here at uh, the IFV or NIPV or whatever you want to call it. I always call it the fire, de uh, fire service college. Um, I was one of the researchers working on the smoke cooling experiments. Um, my job for today is pretty hard. I have to keep it really short, so I give Lars the most amount of time to give his vision on our experiments and everything else in smoke cooling. Because the question we raised is, what are we missing? What are we still missing in the smoke gas cooling uh, literature, material, story? Um, for that, I will take you through the research and uh, the conclusions. And uh, afterwards, uh, uh, Lars will uh, uh, tell us about uh, some of his experiences and uh, asking us the question, what are we missing? And we're also emphasizing on a good discussion with you. So um, uh, I would propose uh, I uh, tell a story about the experiments, uh, some short uh, questions, uh, maximum uh, five minutes about the experiments, and then go to Lars, and we can uh, interact uh, after that. Yeah? So the research we did. Ricardo already told you this morning, but um, a little bit more into detail. What we did was that we built uh, build a, um, uh, a hallway, uh, stone, uh, completely with uh, concrete uh, uh, floor slabs uh, on top of it. Um, there is a fire room on the uh, far side, uh, of course steel, because otherwise we would have to destroy the building every time. Uh, there would be a fire load of somewhere about uh, 8 to 9 megawatts, but it's all ventilation controlled uh, due to the... Um, the design. Um, Ricardo this morning said it was all pellets. It's not all pellets. It's uh, pellets. Uh, it's some so soft board and a mattress, a foam mattress. And it's the same fire load we used uh, during the multiple experiments and we also tested in firehood uh, conditions. Uh, what we did is uh, we made uh, four uh, thermocouple trees and um, these thermocouple trees are a little bit different than a lot of uh, the experiments uh, uh, you saw, uh, for example, this morning, where you can just hang a thermocouple. But if we hit it with a host stream, yeah, our measurements wouldn't be accurate. So what we had to do was shield the thermocouples um, in a steel box, but then we have a problem if the steel box heats up, uh, that will heat up also the thermocouple. So we insulated the inside of the thermocouple box so we can do gas measurements. We also measured uh, radiation on two levels, on the standing level and on the victim level. We also did gas measurements on victim level. <coughs> and um, uh, we also used uh, a lot of cameras uh, to uh, get some data and some uh, results. Um, what we also did is place some, um, yeah, what do you call them? Um, drempel? <laughs> A threshold, a threshold uh, on the floor so that if you uh, advance to the fire, you can feel the threshold and you say threshold so we know you're there. And then afterwards, uh, or during advancement or during uh, the attack, we know that they're over there. We tested um, two methods, 3D pulse and arc. Uh, 3D pulse is the uh, known method uh, teach, the, for instance, in uh, compartment fire behavior training. And the arc method, we used uh, the one, <coughs> see, I forgot to put in the picture, but it's uh, wall to ceiling, almost to the floor. Uh, we used a high pressure hose, 
uh, commonly used in Netherlands, 120 liters per minute, 33 bars. Two types of low pressure hoses, 250 and 450, uh, 10 and 12 bars. And we use the CUFS 1.7 system. Uh, as you can see, we only use the ARC method for that. It's not uh, fitted to use in uh, the pulse method. How did we do the analysis? Uh, Ricardo told it already a little bit this morning. I think we can do two things. We have uh, looked at temperature versus height. It's, um, it's a standardized way of um, analyzing temperature in, uh, in uh, fire conditions, where we look at the temperature uh, versus the height in the hallway. And what we do it, um, uh, to balance it all out is to take the average of the entire length of the hallway at a certain height. For energy, we did uh, another thing. There we used the two-zone method. Uh, and uh, uh, we uh, cut up the hallway into four sections, uh, four thermal couple threes, and we cal calculated back um, uh, the energy amount and also the uh, energy loss due to the doorway. Um, also, I will not be emphasizing it on it today a lot, but we also looked at uh, the safety for firefighters and the safety for victims, um, where we used the um, thresholds uh, for non-life-threatening possibility for rescue and rescue no longer possible we used in the smoke propagation research. First of all, repeatability, uh, repeatability uh, Ricardo already told it you uh, this morning. Um, what is nice to see is that we chose a design where we uh, had a constant factor. So in the entire hallway, there was always a temperature of 200 degrees uh, below the ceiling, not directly below the ceiling, but one below that, 2.2 meters. And it would be stable for at least one minute before we start the test. And um, what you see here are the, all the tests we did at 2 meters, 7 meters, 12 and 17 meters in the hallway with all the data and temperature versus height. And as you can see, they're clustered nicely together, uh, which gives us uh, uh, also with the standard deviations a good uh, insight in that uh, uh, at least the starting conditions of this research are the same. So they, um, they can help us uh, in the, um, uh, how do you say? to compare the two, to compare the techniques. First of all, pulse techniques. Well, what, I, what we did, what my colleague did, <laughs> was uh, to put some camera uh, um, images uh, from the high pressure pulse and the low pressure pulse, and it's the low pressure 250, um, uh, next to each other. So, first um, uh, heat camera, is somewhere around uh, five to seven meters in the hallway. The second camera is somewhere around um, 15 meters in the hallway, 12 to 15 meters in the hallway. And the most right image is the fire room. What can you see? Well, um, it, it, I think I will let it uh, uh, up to Lars what we can uh, see and learn from it. But uh, what we can at least see is that the um, uh, way of advancement uh, so the pulse is that we advance through the threshold, we give a pulse, and we advance again. It's pretty quick. We can do it pretty quick. And we can do it the quickest with the high pressure pulse. Is it weird? No. Less weight, m uh, less counter pressure from the hose, so it's easier to advance. What did we learn from the pulse? Uh, here's also with the temperature. I will come to that later on. But if we look at pulse, it's actually pretty simple. High flow, more local cooling. So if we use more water, we cool more. Um, and we got less of a, saw to a sawtooth effect. What is a sawtooth effect? If we use a pulse and then we advance, the fire gets the uh, opportunity to fill the room with a lot of more energy. So it will heat up once again and uh, get back up. So if you look at the graphs, which will be in here later, uh, you'll see a sawtooth. 
Um, fun thing is, at 450 liters, there wasn't much more cooling effect than 250 liters. We balanced it out. So the geometry of the room, and so a 20 meter hallway of somewhere around two and a half meters wide, uh, uh, you can use 450 <coughs> liters, but there were the thresholds of this uh, amount of water. So at 250, somewhere between 250 and 450 is the optimum. Um, forgot to mention, you see the green um, line on the bottom of the two uh, tests. This indicates where the firefighters are in the hallway. So totally on the left is the entrance, totally on the right is the seat of the fire. Another thing we see at uh, Pulse is uh, if we use high flow, we got more energy, energy reduction, um, of course, but if we, uh, the higher flow also gives us slower movement, as already said. Um, interesting is higher flow gives you more forward cooling, so I can cool more in front of me than with lower flows, but it's not always more backward cooling, which is pretty interesting. Um, the backward cooling of the low pressure 450 uh, 3D pulse equals that of the 3D pulse with the high pressure. How is it possible? Because we're faster. So it's in the design, but the reality of it is if we advance faster, it also uh, levels up with the amount of water we use. So speed versus flow is also a contributing factor. This is the ARC method. Now you can see what we mean. The guys and girls are entering, and um, you see that they're going from bottom to ceiling to bottom. Now you can also see why we had to cover the, <laughs> the thermocouples, um, and also that you can move faster with the high pressure uh, arc. Also notice the effect it has on the seat of the fire, the fire room. You can see a lot of more steam being pushed toward the seat of the fire, and uh, uh, the more the angle is toward the seat of the fire, the more effect you can see on the seat of the fire, so temperature reduction in the fire room. Um, this is the same movie, but then with the temperatures. Actually, the findings are the same. That is why Ricardo already said this morning, we're not looking at uh, if higher flow is better, because yes, we know. I, I, I uh, said it here, and it's also in the report. Uh, but the point is not that the higher flow gives you more cooling. The point is uh, we're looking at the 3D pulse and the arc method. Are they doing the same? Because of the fact that uh, arc method is relatively easily uh, easier to use and to learn for firefighters. At least that is the... Uh, Hypothesis. Can I can do the questions at the end of uh, this presentation? Right. Yeah. Thanks. If you look at the temperature, I, I put them all four together. High pressure arc, low pressure arc, high pressure pulse, low pressure, uh, pressure pulse. So the above line is the high pressure and the uh, below line is the low pressure. Um, of course you can see that they're not all moving at the same speed. Uh, that wasn't the goal of this uh, research. But what you can see is that uh, as soon as they're uh, somewhere uh, halfway into the hallway, if you use a high pressure arc or a high pressure pulse, the temperatures uh, uh, before you are still between uh, 300 to 400 degrees on the ceiling. If you do that with a low pressure arc or low pressure pulse, you do that uh, between 200 and uh, no, 150 and 250 degrees. Um, also good to know is that if you use arc, um, the temperatures behind the firefighter stay cool. Um, if you look at the high pressure pulse behind the firefighter, we are still having far behind them uh, temperatures between 200 and 250 degrees at the ceiling, where it is here 125, uh, uh, 150 degrees centigrade. Ricardo, the, Ricardo already showed you this, but if we look at the temperature versus height decrease, nah, and we have the 
pulse techniques are the uh, first three and the arc techniques are the last three. Uh, you can see that the temperature degrees uh, versus height is um, more using arc techniques. Also, the standard deviation of arc techniques is lower. So it's more, uh, uh, for the instructors doing the experiments, it was easier to uh, copy them, to do exactly the same every time. Um, also good to know is this, the, um, uh, we're looking at the hot zone. Everything that's happening above us, I think that's the most important thing. But uh, I also wanted to mention the cold zone. Um, here you can see that the pulse techniques are influencing the cold zone in temperature more than the arc techniques. So the pulse techniques are raising the temperature more. Is it a lot? No, not that we measured. But the fact that they are um, stirring up the gases and doing something. Um, because when I uh, went to the training, uh, and at the first uh, training I went to, they always told me, you, you have to use a pulse technique so the gases uh, won't uh, come down and don't interfere with the victims uh, on the victim level. But if you see this, you can at least ask questions, how does this work? not going into that now. If you um, also, uh, Ricardo told you, uh, we're looking at energy change. Energy change hasn't been done a lot. We're all, uh, always looking at temperature. Um, but uh, in this study and also a recent Canadian study uh, looked at uh, uh, energy change. Um, if you look at the energy change, every um, color represents uh, a part of the hallway uh, with the uh, light pink uh, is the mo uh, part of the hallway closest to the seat of the fire. Um, what you can see is that uh, the arc techniques are better capable of reducing the energy far in the hallway and also near the entrance. Um, if I kijk, um yeah, the, um, what is also remarkable is that um, the standard deviation of the measurements uh, uh, of, uh, it decreased, so it got better when the flow rate increases. So again, it's a sign that if we have flow, it's more uh, better able to, um, how do you call it, vergevingsgezind? Forgivable, yeah. Thank you for my, being my souffleur. <laughs> I have to look at the time, so I'm going a little bit faster. <coughs> forward or backward cooling. This is the thing we saw about forward and backward cooling. Uh, we used it with a straight stream and with the pulse techniques. Um, for instance, these below graphs are both uh, high pressure uh, tests. And um, you can see here the difference what I call a salt tooth. Um, we are advancing and we're uh, giving a thrust, so uh, we're cooling, and then we're advancing, oh, and the temperature gets back up again. And we're cooling, and we're advancing, and we're cooling. So You don't see that with the arc. Also not uh, behind the um, firefighter team. This is the, um, we uh, calculated the meter uh, design, uh, also averages. If we look at the amount of forward and backward cooling, uh, what you see is that the uh, arc methods are well able to cool far ahead of it. But um, interesting here is that it, the backward cooling is somewhat better. Most interesting is that if you use uh, low pressure, that it cools um, amount the same backward as a high pressure, which is pretty interesting. Um, I think we think that it's uh, in the flow also with the speed, uh, has to do with the speed. Then, I think uh, an important point on which uh, Lars will emphasize more, the influence of execution. 
what we did was uh, we had a straight hallway. And before we uh, got into these tests, every day we had different instructors. These are um, very experienced instructors who teach daily. We trained them for an hour and a half in how to do the techniques. They did it dry, they did it with hose line, also in this hallway. They know the seat of the fire, they have a small room, they have a wall so they got, can have their bearings right. And still, in about half of the cases, the instructors aren't able to um, do the technique right. It's not only with pulse, it's also with arc. They're, there's the seat of the fire and they're spraying in the wall next to them. They just don't always got their bearings. And it's, um, if you're a firefighter, it's true. If you're inside and you can't see anything, uh, how can we know where the seat of the fire is at the same time as we're using a, a really hard uh, hose? And it requires a lot of training, um, a lot of um, ease, and we don't always have that. Uh, oh. If you look at the influence on the seat of the fire, um, interesting here is that here the um, low flow, high flow uh, thing doesn't always uh, add up. So it's not always the same as with the results in the smoke cooling. So what we're measuring here is, uh, can we influence the seat of the fire by cooling the smoke during advancement? Um, what you see here is uh, we have uh, two measurement uh, uh, types. It's the outflow opening, so where the uh, hot gases are leaving the fire room. And we have a measurement inside the fire room. Um, and what we can see here is that, um, the, of course, if you use a higher flow, you can cool it better. But um, uh, the, actually, the speed is more important always than the flow. So if you look at the uh, ARC 350, uh, 450 and uh, uh, 450 3D pulse, it's about the same. And um, if you kijk, uh, um, but also if you look at the standard deviation of the, the 3D pulse techniques, they're a lot of uh, they're a lot bigger. So uh, we can. Um, have different types of executions, but uh, the speed in which we progress to the speed of, uh, seat of the fire also contributes to influencing the seat of the fire. If we look at the conclusions of the study, and it's, uh, for me, uh, I am slash was a researcher, so it's good to be scientific. This is a research, uh, and with the design, in this hallway, in these conditions, with the door open constantly. Um, so these conclusions uh, are for this research. On the amount of uh, extrapolation to the rest of the fire service, that's up to the fire service academy. Um, but now only for this research. Um, high flow greater decrease in temperature, we know that. Um, if we have a higher, of uh, uh, a 3D pulse technique has more uh, increase in the cold zone, uh, and an arc technique has a greater degrees, uh, decrease in the warm zone for temperature. If you look at energy change, also the high flow uh, rule continues, but the energy, energy decrease uh, exceeds the 3D pulse technique in all segments. Um, for forward cooling, the pulse technique is lo localized uh, uh, more in front of you, so um, it doesn't go that deep into the hallway. And it has a shorter duration, hence the sawtooth. And uh, if you use arc, you can cool further in front of you. Backward cooling. If you use a pulse technique, that sometimes leads to a rise in temperature behind the firefighter team. Uh, and with the R technique, uh, the temperature remained the lowest behind the team. Uh, both techniques influence the seat of the fire. The arc has more cooling effect. Um, and for, I placed it here, but I think it should be in both columns. 
speed uh, and progression is key. So I think Ricardo already showed you this slide. So uh, small cooling works, they both work. But the point is that uh, we've been told for many years that the arc technique doesn't work. And I think we can at least start a discussion now uh, saying that the arc technique does work, but I will leave it to Lars. Um, for the time, are there any questions about the research part of it? Yeah, because I already saw a question there. Uh, uh, maybe this gentleman in the... Yeah? yeah. Um, the, the last uh, conclusion, more consistent result, the easier to learn and, and uh, use. Yeah. Um, I think it's a misconception to think that it's easier to learn. Uh, I think it's easier to understand how it works, but to execute it, it's really not easy. It's hard to do, and it's even so hard that I know in, in, in practice, uh, a lot of instructors don't even teach it to the students right now, okay. because it's too difficult to execute. In combination with no movement. Is it? Um, because the interesting thing for, for me as a former scientist, I would think it would be an instrument of uh, interesting research design. So why uh, is this the fact? Why is it uh, being perceived as harder to teach and to train? Because there can be many factors leading to this result, right? Yeah. Reaction force uh, to push against that, that's hard. Uh, uh, communication with the person behind you is almost impossible. Um, what, what has to be done making this movement, everybody understands that. That's easy to learn. Uh, yeah. You should try it. And, and, we'll, and, and also, the way you have to step, the way it's told here, well, that's almost impossible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it's a good um, message to uh, uh, Ricardo and the, the team of deans here at the uh, Fire Service Academy to uh, think about this uh, problem more and to uh, yeah, maybe uh, have a discussion with all the instructors how to, uh, to teach this uh, in a better way. And I, yeah. I have tried it several times and I do have some uh, positive uh, uh, experiences with it. I, I really felt that it became a lot uh, cooler. Mm -hmm. But also moving forward, oh, that's really different. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, question. You did it with high pressure or low pressure? Uh, low pressure. Low pressure. And also, uh, in which amount? 250? Uh, 450. Yeah, 450. 450, we saw in our experiments, 450 is far too difficult to. to, to yeah, we you have can't, you can't really do it with uh, 450. Yeah, you that's can do correct. it with 450, but not with the pressure so we are setting on the hose line. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. I think that the overkill on water is, is high enough to, to reduce the, the, the flow. And I, I also think that that's the reason that the, the results are so consistent. Okay. The overkill is so so much that everybody reaches that same level of cooling. Yeah, but we did it also the same flow rate with the pulse techniques. And then we saw a difference. But in the amount of same time you yeah less water with the pulse technique then in the same time of, uh, okay. of of the time, so that's yeah. and because the pulse technique puts water, then you move forward, but with the continuous uh, arch technique, continuous flow of water, yeah. that's the difference. I will leave this to Lars because he will talk about effectiveness and efficiency. Yeah. Uh, efficiency. Um, because of the time, I will move on. Uh, <laughs> 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 I want to give the, the, the man from Sweden a podium, so... Uh. Lars, if you can have the floor. I can. Uh, well, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Thais. Hi, and nice to see you. So I will try to build on sort of the conclusions here, and I will talk about those, but also I will put a lot of my own thoughts in, in from my life. <laughs> Grand firefighting <laughs> into this and try to look at how do I look at straight stream gas cooling and the history about gas cooling in Sweden and so on. Where do I where do I end up right now? Uh, but before we start, thank you, Nipf. <laughs> I don't know. 
<laughs> I know that sounds bad, but I don't know why. <laughs> but anyway, very glad that you have the guts to do research into something that's holy, which is which this is, which is like awesome. Even if you if, even if it's not even good research, which it's, it it is, <laughs> it would just be awesome that we're trying. Like, like actually poking on things that we consider to be like holy, like like gas cooling, because it's so integrated in, in our history, like the last 20, 30 years. Uh, I'm not a researcher. I do not provide evidence. I don't have evi evidence to give. Uh, so don't listen to me in that sense. <laughs> I'm just a nerdy firefighter. I love firefighting. I do a lot of instructing. I provide thoughts. That's what I do. Don't take my thoughts as truths. Don't take it as evidence. Uh, just take it from what it is. And when I talk, I talk about generic behaviors. When I saw, say the Swedish firefighters suck, I don't mean every Swedish firefighter. There's probably some, someone who's not sucking at something. But generically, I talk about certain things I see as trends. So don't be personally offended if I say that Germany, German firefighters are very bad. <laughs> Which I won't, but, but don't take it as a personal insult. <laughs> um, I want to talk about cooling efficiency at first. Um, in Sweden, we don't have two words for efficiency and effectiveness. I don't know how much that actually changed how Sweden looks at this problem, but it might. It's called effektivitet in Sweden. It's the same word for efficiency and effectiveness. So efficiency is, we've, we've been focused, if you want to talk about efficiency, we have talked a lot about surface area water. Like we've talked about droplet sizes and we want to distribute and everything. And this theory is sound, of course. More surface area means more rapid heat absorption. Sound, great. We have talked about a lot about by droplet speed, hang time, and travel distance. The longer you can have contact between the water and the smoke, the more you can absorb energy. So you want it to be, you want the droplet to be in the smoke as long as possible. And you want it to travel as fast as possible while still staying there. <laughs> it would be best if it could just go around. Because you want speed, because speed absorbs energy faster. It's like, it's just, it's just, it just does. And we talked about limited surface cooling during this time, because we don't want to waste a lot of water, it just cause water damages, we don't want to produce a lot of steam, and we don't think that surface cooling on the way to the fire, not talk about actually suppressing the fire, on the way to the fire, that's not really that important. It might even be a problem that we're creating steam and so on. So we've, we've very limited talk about surface cooling as a part of smoke cooling. And then we, of course, I don't know if we can put some lights. It's hard to see the videos, but, but we've, we've had the short pulls. Maybe we can shut down the, the ones in front. I don't know. I, that doesn't matter. Uh, we have a short pulse. That's sort of the, the, uh, the main efficiency of, of what we talk about. We do a short pulse. We small, fine droplets, put them up. Don't let it hit the surface. But of course, if you're inside a, a toilet, that's, that's maybe enough. Like you, you, you sort of cover the space. But if you're in a, anything bigger than a toilet, you have a problem. You don't, you're not actively cooling the entire space. Now, we've known that, but we simply didn't know that also because we were doing a lot of short pulses into big volumes for a long time. And you could potentially do that if you have a lot of speed, if you run in. You could probably do short pulses, like, like I showed in a couple of years ago, Anders Bogan Larian. You could put a small pulse in front of the other one and sort of cover the space fast. But we shouldn't run. That's, that's just <laughs> not <b> good. <laughs> uh, and we also have a problem with time. If you, do, if you do a short pulse, you need to distribute the, the time problem. Again, why you run. If you do a short pulse, again, it just, it just goes away because we are working in a flow. Generally, when we're progressing towards the fire, we are in a flow. If we close the door, it's less of a flow, but it's still a flow. So we have a time problem. And this is part of what, what, what the study finds, that we have a time problem. We, 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 if we cool further ahead of us, we reduce the time component. If we flow all the time, 
which you don't have to do if you do straight stream. You could just cool straight stream and then advance also. That's fully possible. It wasn't just part of this study. Look at the UL studies for flow and move and instead. But you cool a further ahead of you, which also means that you get more cooling usually behind you. We try to, to incorporate that time issue. So you have this cooling effectiveness. When we talk about being effective, actually achieving smoke cooling, not talking about efficiency, meaning how it is done efficiently, we focus instead on things like liter versus watts, like how, how much flow. You need a certain amount of flow. The more flow you have, generically, the faster you cool. It's not always true. And it's, of course, a portion of it that is efficiency, but it's, it's a very strong indicator in a lot of research that the more flow you use, the, the faster you cool. And of course, there's also a minimum, like if you don't have enough cooling capacity at all, you will fail. Which many of European firefighters have experienced because we put the we pull the booster line on a big fire and you go like that. This this does not work. <laughs> yeah, it, there's a limitation to how efficient you can be. So we focus a lot on liter versus watt, and we focus on massive surface cooling, like just overflow American style. That's been. If you want to be effective, you just want to massively pound everything. If you could, you want to fill the, the, the building up with water and so it pours out of the, of the ceiling. That's the most effective way of achieving cooling, if you could. If you could just dump the fire truck through the, through the roof hatch, right? And we focus on droplet distribution space. You want to cover all the space at the same time. You just don't, you don't want to have a little bit of here, a little bit of here. You, you want to have real coverage of whatever those droplets are. And you want to have droplet distribution in time. You want to have the droplets there all the time. You just don't want it a little bit here and a little bit later. You, do that. you want it all the time. And we have these two paradigms. We have, if we want to generically say we have the American way, which is massively cool as much as possible. Take the biggest hose line that you can manage, train so that you can be more effective with that hose line, and drown the place. And we have the traditional Swedish way of we want to be efficient, we want to use as little water as possible because we want to preserve water damage, we want to have small fire trucks, we want to be fast, and so on, and we want to be efficient. But there's something missing here, I think, I think in the latest years, we've been trying to address that, but we haven't done a very good job. I think we're, but we're going towards it. So if we want to have more effective distribution of droplets in space, of course, that's where the long pulse came in. We want to cover the space more efficiently, so we do a long pulse. Or Americans, you would just do a long straight stream. We want to cover the space more. Fine. So we sort of retired the, s the short pulse, unless you're in a bathroom. Retire the, the short pulse, because we want to be more effective. But of course, we got to the point where we had this discussion, of course, steam expansion and smoke contraction. Because if you talk to Americans, the Europeans are steaming the shit out of themselves because you're using fog, and that is worthless because everything goes everywhere and it's steam everywhere. And if you talk to European firefighters, the Americans are steaming the shit out of their firefighters because they're using a lot of water on surfaces, and that's just horrible. So everybody's steaming everyone, but nobody seems to be get steam burns anywhere. So it, it's, a, it's a very, very, very co strange conversation. But anyway, steam expansion, of course, is real. This is great for suppression. Awesome. Maybe not so great for firefighters if, if we do have steam, like most people have been steam burned. We're going to get to if that's a real problem in real buildings, but most people have experienced it when you go into the fire compartment in a, in a metal box and you go, and you go like, this is not comfortable. <laughs> I don't want to be here anymore. <laughs> so most people have experienced that. And of course, it's possibly horrible for rescues. Like that's in a fire suit. If you don't have a fire suit, it's nah, nah, not a good idea. <laughs> if you're in a nice sauna, and if you put some water on the sauna, eh, it's not so nice anymore, unless you're finished. And then, you know, like there's some different things in the system. Uh, but unless you're finished, it's, th it's not very comfortable. And if you're in a wet sauna, which is like 100% humidity, you would die at those, those temperatures in a, in a dry sauna. 
and we know this. This is not rocket science. This is just you could you could just go into a sauna and try it yourself. Like a lot of steam sucks. And then we have smoke contraction, which is of course great for everyone. So if we can achieve smoke contraction, that is great regardless of what method we're using. That just proves that we're cooling. Like that's awesome. Everything gets up in the air, whether it's steam, toxic gases, great. So we have this steam expansion question, and the question, of course, is, is it really a problem? And, and in that sense, is it something we need to handle, and how do we handle it? On, on, the, other on the other side, I don't it doesn't seem to be a real big problem, because we have so many different tactic, techniques and thoughts about firefighting all over the world, but firefighters are not generally being chased out of the buildings because of steam bursts. So there's two pieces of my brain going like, this is a problem, but this is not really a problem. <laughs> I don't know which brain to listen to. It's just, it's just complicated. When we sit in a fire compartment, as a firefighter, we, we sit there and, and, and you do something with your nozzle and, and all of a sudden you know, things come down. And you just go like, it's, it's, it's hard to know why that happened. Like, why is it that sometimes it just smoke comes down and everything? Go like, is it, was it steam expansion? Was it a, the fire gas ignition? Was it like expansion from the fire? Was it, was it some mechanical force with the voice? It's just hard to know. So, so if you're inclined to say that it was steam expansion, you go like, ah, that was steam expansion. Look, that's bad. If you don't think it's steam expansion, you maybe you make something other, other things up. A fog will push smoke in front of the droplets. This is not something that's really new, but we sort of haven't accounted for it. Like in front of the stream, everything will get pushed. Like there's an overpressure in front of that stream. And it's just physics. If you throw something in the air, especially a lot of it, there's, there's, there's air being pushed in front of it. If you look at old drawings of smoke cooling, it's also that, that the smoke, the, the, the water always just magically slide into the smoke and the smoke just stayed there. Like, no, no, that's not, that's not at all how it works. Like, that's not how it works. But a straight stream also pushes. If you put a straight stream in front of, front of that smoke, it would also push everything behind. Like, in front of that fog that's created in the ceiling, it, it will act the same way. Like, there's, it's just physics. If you create droplets in the air here, it will push everything also in front of it. Now, when the smoke, when the smoke hits the back wall, of course, when it's pushed to the back wall, it will push down because it can't push any further. It will push out. Like, that's just mechanical force. It's just, it's just overpressure in front of that stream. It can't go in, into the wall, so it has to go down and outwards, and it goes everywhere. So if we look at this video again, it's a bit, bit hard with the lights, but you can see the thermal imager here with the nozzle operator. We'll see they open the door, they put the stream up here, it's a sort of a narrow fog, and you, sh you, sh you see everything just being pushed down. You can see, like, visually, you know, the flows just gets pushed down. It's just a mechanical force. You're pushing the smoke in front of you, and it gets pushed into the wall, and it pushes down. Now, before we had thermal imagers, it was kind of hard to know that. Uh, you could say that that's violent steam expansion pushing down, but why would it expand just down and not towards the firefighter in that case, or back to the stream? You can see it with a straight stream. You're sitting here, cooling in the ceiling. You will see it push down here. You will see it push down here. It, it pushes everything down because it hits the back wall and it pushes down. It's just, it's just mechanical force. You can see it here, but it's harder because now we're in a more realistic scenario. We have a smoke layer here igniting. We can see a little bit of the window here. A straight stream hits the ceiling. It pushes everything down. You can see it a little bit in thermal imager. But in this situation where we mostly are, we have zero idea what's happening. <laughs> like, it feels good. It feels good. Now it doesn't feel so good anymore. I don't know why. I don't know why should I use more water, because it's the water that's the problem, or is the water the solution? I don't know. And that's like, th that's not a good place to be. <laughs> I'm getting steam burns. Should I use more water or less? Well, there's two, th there's two thoughts in my head go like, use war, condense that steam, or use less because I don't want more steam burns. Go like, the both of those could be true. Open the door. Or open the, yes, absolutely open the door. At suppression, open the door. But what if I'm as in a position where I'm cooling gases, I don't have an, any impact on the fire yet. I'm just sitting there, I don't know, have any idea. Maybe I don't want to open the door. 
But we have this, we, we don't really know what's going on. But we do know that things are happening, and we need to understand that. So a fog will pull smoke from behind and on the side of the droplet. So if I put a fog here, and I put a fog, it will pull everything now. So it pushes in front of it, and it pulls around. I mean, that's, that's the hydraulic ventilation. That's we're using the stream as a ventilation tool. And that's going to be extremely useful. In this case, the firefighter will step inside the room, the smoke will ignite, you use a fog, and it pulls it everything into the stream, because it was a fog. It just pulls everything back into the fog. It was very effective. It was a fire here, fire here, fire here, but I used the fog, and it pulls everything down. I'm not saying that was intentional. They had zero idea what they was doing. But it looks cool. I'm just saying that it's not bad to, to entrain air or entrain fire into it. That's a very really good way of so sort, of, sort of getting the smoke back into the stream. But it is an effect that we need to account for. Now instead, if, I take, if I'm in the bottom here, if I'm in the bottom of a staircase, it's a bit, bit hard to see up here with the light, but that's the top floor. You can see the top floor in the thermal imager. You can see here on the, on the second floor, that's the visual on the second floor. You can't see anything. But if you go up with a, with a fog here and you pulse, now you're taking fresh air from the staircase here and pushing it towards the fire compartment. And if you're, if you're not continuously flowing, it will come back. And maybe in that case, it will mix with oxygen. It comes back, and you get ignitions. And most firefighters and instructors have experienced this in a container. It, there's no fire. I do a pulse, and it, uh, suddenly there's fire. Because we're mixing, and we're taking oxygen, and we're mixing. And if there was if we were close to the flammable limit, maybe that was giving over the th threshold. I'm not saying that that's a problem. You just use a little bit more water, and then you're done. But we are taking whatever is behind us or where we are and pushing it forward. Now, if we take another system in that case, we don't take manual firefighting, we take sprinklers, it's the same thing. If we have here a, a sprinkler system inside a, a small room, we will see on here that the sprinkler, in that case, comes from above. That's the fog. It will entrain air and it will push everything down. So it will push the smoke down at the floor and out. Like the, the room was pretty good until the sprinkler system went out. Now that's usually not a problem. I talk, uh, as like, like I mentioned here, that, but in this case, the, the sprinkler system is activated so early that it doesn't really matter if the smoke is pushed down because there's no heat, it's not a lot of steam, not a lot of toxic gases. Well, it's not the same if we do it with a 600 degree smoke layer and we push everything down. It might not be best for, for instance, people we rescue. It's much more visible here if we take a big. Sorry, didn't press the audio. If we take this, we'll see that it pushes the smoke down. It takes the smoke down with it, and it circulates back, and it becomes like a sort of a vortex. I mean, it's an inverted pulse up into the sky. This is just physics. And, and the power of, of the entrainment and so on is so powerful that you take hot gases and push them down to the floor. So it goes against what the smoke actually want to do. And it goes down, and it goes out, and it goes back in. And so we have this circulation. Again, when sprinkler systems, I'm not saying you shouldn't have sprinkler systems. <laughs> That's not the point I'm trying to make. You should have sprinkler systems. They're awesome. Unless you want to do firefighting, then you don't want a sprinkler system. So it depends on our goal. But anyway, so the, 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 physical, the physics of it is that you will, you will entrain things up here and pull it down, or you will entrain things down here and pull it up. It's just physics. A straight stream pulls air from behind inside of the droplets. It's just that the straight stream creates the droplets up here instead. Instead of here, we, we, it goes up into the stream. So wherever the straight stream breaks up into droplets, that's where you have the entrainment. So if you have a straight stream up in the ceiling, you wouldn't have the negative pressure down here. You would have the negative pressure down here. And then it would act basically like a sprinkler. It could. So if we take the same scenario with a fire on the second floor, we're going to suppress it with a straight stream up the attic, you're going to see that when the straight, straight stream hits straight up, the smoke will come down because it will pull the smoke with it, all the droplets falling down. So we put straight stream up and the smoke layer instantly drops to the second floor. So, so the straight stream is not immune to moving air. Not at all. It's just that it moves it in a different position from a different place. And here we see it together, you will see the two effects. You will see a straight stream hit this lintel here, and you will see the pulling effect up, because that's where the negative pressure is. 
in front of the stream of overpressure will hit the backside, come back here and go that way. So you will see it pulls up here. Now air goes here, air goes here, and now it hits coming back. And you start to have that rotation. And as an instructor, it's great to play with smoke machines and see how the streams hitting different places affect air movement. It's, it might be important. <laughs> so we have this, those two paradigms where we focused a lot on these two things. And I think that, of course, truth is like always, it's in the middle, like efficiency matters. Like you need to be efficient to be effective, but you also need to be effective. Like if you're not effective, you can go home. Like, the <laughs> like I was very efficient at burning the building down. It's not a good way to end the sentence. Like that's not good to go to the paper. Like we were very efficient. Uh, every water was evaporated. Everybody died. Like that's not a good outcome. So efficiency is sort of secondhand, and we'll get to that. So we need to merge that, but there's something missing, and that's of course fluid dynamics. Like fluid is this most often missing, and it's became becoming less. So what's fluid dynamics? It's the science of movement of liquids and gases. It sounds awfully like flow path and air tracks. We just put a new word on it <laughs> because we're the fire service. We, we like to think that we invented this ourselves. Like, no, no. <laughs> Most of the world understood this long time ago. We have a lot of scientists who are experts in fluid dynamics. They don't just know that we need it also. Like more of it, a lot. But it's very not very common or easily visible in scientific data or mentioned in conclusions. Like if you look at studies on manual firefighting, this is not something you read about. You don't read about air movements. You don't read about entrainment. You don't need about that. That's just the latest years that you all start to mention it and so on. So we shouldn't be like <laughs> we shouldn't be like very <laughs> self-critical because this hasn't been part of the literature. But it's still, I mean, we've taught hydraulic ventilation for a long time. <laughs> and that's the thing I have struggled with in my mind. Like, how can I know something exists over here, but don't apply it over here? Like, there's a, like there's a bridge, <laughs> a wall between my left brain and my right brain. Like, I do know that the hydraulic ventilation moves a lot of air, but inside the building, it magically doesn't. Like, no. <laughs> well, it does too. Where is the air going? I don't know, but it might be important. And it's not easily visible in scientific data. Even if you know to look for it, it it's very those things happen very quick. And usually, like even if you do thermocouple data, you like you, you you saturate them from a couple seconds, so you don't see those s very fast spikes because they're very annoying. <laughs> like they, they mess up my curve. But like those those things were being pushed around and so on, they happen very fast. It can be very hard to see those flows without modern good thermal imagers. It's just the latest, I, I would say five years, like with the latest thermal images, that you really start to see those flows. So before that, as a firefighter, we didn't see that. Usually you saw nothing. But even if you saw a flow, you didn't see where it came from. You just saw the end result, maybe smoke being pushed down. How, how it's very hard to connect the dots if you don't know what's going on. And fluid dynamics is like, if, if, if fire science is hard, fluid dynamics is like even harder. And, and fire, of course, modeling fire is, is, is basically fluid dynamics. But we've just been like one compartment, okay, the sort of figured out, <laughs> sort of. Multiple compartments, a oh, lot of variables, a lot of rooms for mistakes. Like put manual firefighting in there, oh, it breaks down folding. <laughs> we can't do that, it's like impossible. You can't. You can't hardly put a sprinkler inside there and, and not mess everything up. The only thing you can ma make it out if you have something real to compare it with. So the, okay, is the model still right? Is the model no? It doesn't. Okay, I just tweak the model. But to make predictions without having the 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 real data, the real fire to compare it with, like very hard. So this fluid dynamics is like super complicated. I just understand 95% of it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just, no, it's just very complicated. Um, so the the result is like even the, these two they might look sort of different. Like if you do a, like a stream straight up in the air with a straight stream or a fog, they sort of look the same. But they're really not. They're very much not. The fog you will have something like this. You will have a lot of entrainment coming from here. You will have entrainment coming here, and you will have the overpressure pushing out. So you would have some kind of rotation. While with the stream, you will only have this rotation up here. 
Now, of course, there's other variables, but th these are, even if you do it like two meters up, they will produce a change. If you do it in a, in a, like in a, in a Hollywood container, if you do a straight stream straight up, you'll see this. It doesn't come down, at least not extent, and you see that it pushes out in all directions and it sort of works. It's a way better protection against flashovers than the, than the falling on your back and doing a wide fog that the Germans did. No, not all. Not all. <laughs> Container, yeah, and you, when you have the LPG frame yeah. and uh, you see wide angle, yeah. the flames moving uh, under the under yeah. Your shield, yeah? yeah, it's no problem in the uh, LPG container to demonstrate this. No, so it, it, we have a we have like said, the, the, there's there's multiple problems we've done in the past, <laughs> all countries <laughs> done some horrible, stupid things, uh, but we're trying to get better. <laughs> uh, and if you take the same one, of course, if you're outside a compartment, like I talked about before, then it's also a massive difference. It's not the same at all. Uh, both produce droplets inside the compartment. Both will stir, but it, they're very not the same. With a fog, you will, of course, like I've shown before, you will put a fog in here, you will overpress your space, and it will come back out. It's, it's about entrainment. It's about overpressurization. With a straight stream, you don't because you're not putting new air in, so you're not overpressurizing, and the negative, negative portion is up in the ceiling. There's a huge difference to where that fog is created. So with a fog, it uh, looks something like this. You're entraining new air that will overpressurize and has to come out. You still get a lot of, like, it, will, it will push everything around in there. Whatever is up on top will go down. The same is for a straight stream, but, it, but in that case, we at least won't pressurize the compartment. It will still push everything around. Like even the most dedicated smoothbore operator in America will say, "Yeah, when you when you put the stream on, everything, every visibility you had was gone to zero. Like if you had something, all streams will move things around. But it's not the same. In small in small volumes, they might they might work the same. If you're inside the volume, let's say you're inside a hallway, let's say you're inside a small room, they basically work the same." you will get a rotation, you straight stream get a rotation. They basically work the same. Now, if you, then we have fl flow differences and there's speed differences, otherwise that, but that's a, just as a static, you, you put a stream in. They will sort of work the same, they both will work. If you have an outlet, let's say it's just an opening here, both will work the same, both will just push whatever is in front of them, round. It will, it will just hydraulically vent everything in front of you, which is the American way of doing firefighting, or at least a part of America. Like, just push everything forward. Like, push everything in front of you, which works if you have an outlet and sort of like a hallway type, which you can push everything through. It doesn't work if you have an open-spaced room. Everything's just pushed around. But if you have a long hallway, maybe you can push everything in forward to you. And you would do that with a fog, too. But if you have an open space, if you put a fog in, things will move over here. Like th th it will push things over here. And if it, it, we will push things somewhere else if we don't have an outlet. Maybe it's into another room. Maybe it's back to ourselves if it's a U-shape like this, which is the same for a straight stream. If you put it in a ceiling here, you will move air over here. Because in front of the stream, there will be an overpressure, and the overpressure pushes everything here, and you start to rotate everything. And I've been in that exact situation. <laughs> I remember being, it was fairly early in my career, it was a fire on the second floor. I went up the stairs as a number two. Number one was coming up and it was you know, dark, it was hot, and he was seeing fire here, fire here. So there was a, it was coming basically a U-turn U because the wall separating the two rooms, so one room here, one room here, was burnt away. So he did a fog that way, and it get hot, and he did a fog that way, and it was so hot we have just, you know, tumbled down the stairs, just whoa, 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 and then up again, and, so and then down again. And we were just, of course, pushing everything around. It was just a, a, all the heat that we created over here was just pushed around like that. That would be the same with the straight stream, unless we put the straight stream through the window, actually suppress the fire that was inside the room. So it matters if I put the stream in front of the room or into the room. Huge difference. Huge difference in terms of what the experience would be as in that situation of me as a firefighter. 
So if we have cooling efficiency, cooling effectiveness sort of dialed down, I'm not saying we have, <laughs> we have to find sort of the, the middle ground here, what's an acceptable loss of buildings when we, when we instead of drowning everything, what's an acceptable loss of, 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 of how much things can cost, like how big can a fire truck be to hold water, how, how expensive could a hydrant system be to produce a lot of flows and so on. We are, whether we like it or not, have to be efficient to some level or not. And of course, being efficient means that you can be effective. But we have to really find a way to include air movements, like a difference. And air movements are important. Like we do with ventilation, of course, fans, awesome. We do air movements with fire, awesome. But we also need to do air movements with streams in different ways. Because it will affect whatever we're doing as firefighters. So what is the objective? Of course, we want to rescue people. We want to keep firefighters safe. The order of that depends on who you ask. Some say firefighters' lives are worth less, some say the civilians' lives are worth less, and some say they were equal. I'm just saying that both of those are probably important, because the firefighters are people too. <laughs> uh, but it, it is a, it's an ongoing debate, which is a lot of culture. And of course that afterwards we need to save property and environment. Not a, not a strange thing. Why I'm saying this is because if we're to choose between efficiency and effectiveness, we have to choose effectiveness. Because efficiency is about, a lot of times, about saving money for the public or making sure the building is not drowned. Okay, so if we need to do something, at least we should, like, put the fire out. So we want to be effective at doing rescues. We want to be effective at doing cooling. And second one, we have to understand air movement. Like, that's, that's crucial. Air movements by fire, air movements by fans, air movements by, by streams. We have to understand that because otherwise we can't be safe, we can't be effective. Because we will, we will, and I know talking to so many firefighters from, I, do, I burn a lot of houses, that's why, why, why that's, it's, it's amazing. <laughs> I don't put burn other people's houses who don't want it burned. <laughs> I'm allowed to burn their houses, <laughs> just to be clear. <laughs> I burn a lot of houses for training, for acquired structures. We have a lot of derelict buildings in Sweden. It's a big country, a lot of houses are zero use. Uh, so we do training, and when we go through this, this thing, we'll talk about where do you put your stream, how, what happens if you put it here, what happens if you put it here, put it, put it happening. Every firefighter almost guaranteed will say, I've been to this situation, I've been to this situation, I just didn't know that this was a problem. And I have the same experience every time I look. I, I go like, yeah, I've been here. I've been in that hallway where I do a fog and I do continuous flow. And after a while, I'm being chased out in the, in the, in the staircase because I was overpressurizing the fire compartment in front of me. I've been to that fire. Most people have. They just don't know it. It was just a bad fire. It was just unbearably hot or some inexplicable reason to why it didn't work. It wasn't enough flow. Well, probably, probably something to do with how we use our nozzle in some way. And then, of course, we want cooling efficiency. We want to have efficiency because we want to be effective. We, of course, want to be efficiency because we are, are the people who pay our salaries want to have value for money and so on. We can't spend enough because at some point they will say, no, fuck it, you're not going to get a new fire truck. Let's put an ambulance in there instead because it's not, it's not justifiable. So if we want to be, if we have to, to be effective, we have to be efficient to get more resources, or at least do more with the resources we have. But I think this is a paradigm shift that Sweden has to really take, uh, uh, like have discussions about, because if, if, if efficiency has been that important, to the point I would argue that we're losing, at least putting firefighters at risk, and potentially putting lives at list, risk because we're not being successful, when we're trying to be very efficient, we have a problem. So we have to switch this around. I'm not saying we should go to the point where we become American, because America has forgotten about efficiency. That word doesn't exist <laughs> in their vocabulary, because water is cheap and so on, but it's not. It's, it, the, the hydrogen system is expensive. The big fire truck is expensive. It's hard to move a, a big host line. Like There's many drawbacks of trying to do, for instance, higher flow to compensate for poor efficiency for because you're aiming wrong or maybe not switching to a fog when you should switch to a fog, if that is the case. So I want to, when was the, when was, when we going to end? 
10 minutes. Yeah. So I want to open up for questions about this. And I then and, and we have some prepared some discussion points. At least I want to like thoughts to bring forward besides this. But if someone has a question right now, we can take jump to something straight. Yeah. Uh, in most, uh, if not all, the <coughs> uh, cases, the straight stream is actually more effective. That's at least what I get from the story. Into protecting yourself as a firefighter. No, uh, if I were, if yes. Well, or, yeah, yeah. Well, so, so the question is, can you come up with any example where you where you would use a, a wider stream as opposed to a straight stream? Yeah, I mean, every every small compartment is probably more efficient to do with this with a with a with so a with a fog. Small compartments, wide enough. If you if you're in a bedroom, you're probably more efficient. What the, uh, if I were to do this presentation in America, it would look different because I push people's buttons. Like I want to, you know, if I if I well, tell you, yeah, I pushed any of my buttons. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I want to drive you to a certain direction. Yourself, I want to give you thoughts about it. Well, okay, so what what are the advantages of the system? Okay, let's let's look on that. So. You were to me, but it, there's two questions in that. The first one is, yeah. would it be most effective to, to, for instance, use a straight stream when I go into that bedroom, for instance? Yes, because I don't want to pressurize it. I want to push, I want to ha keep it in front of me. When I get into the, to the bedroom, actually nozzle inside the doorway, would I switch to a, to a fog? Yes. Okay, second part of that question is, do you think that's functional with seven weeks of training on a part-time firefighter in Sweden? Like, no. Like, they don't even know that they're in a, the, the, the bedroom at some point. Like, because you're going like this. And you're like, eh, it seems to have everything out. I don't know. Let's stop. Put up thermal imager. Where am I? That's the reality. I'm not, I, I, of course, I'm doing it with a, no, I'm not, even, <laughs> not even exaggerating. That is what it looks like. But that's probably just 15 years experience to do that. Not yeah. <laughs> yes. So, so. To put the ease of use, I was, I, I was doing so. I, I was doing a. This is for the training. You can see the. They, they have a very strict, like this is how you should do. You know exactly where you are. Good instructors. Even then, you have sort of a narrow fog here going the right direction. Here you have a wide fog going into the side wall. I'm not surprised at all about that. Like when I, <laughs> I was going to do this is me. So I'm, I'm sort of not above average in skill level in firefighters. I sort of know what I'm trying to do. I've seen the environment in acquired structure burns. So I was going to do, I want to do a video that shows how this should be done. Okay, so, I was, so we were doing a high acquired structure burn and sort of middle of training, I was taking the nozzle, I was going to do one, one, one fire attack. And it was going to be, basically it was a kitchen area, I entrance here, I was going to go basically f maybe five meters, make a left turn through the kitchen into a second room here. So probably 10 meters I was going to advance with a, with a left-hand turn. So I had a thermal imager. I was sitting there waiting for the fire to start to roll. Put the thermal imager down, started going to whip. And after a while, I started getting to find a wall. I go like, okay, that's the, that's the left wall. I'm going to turn r left. Okay, so now actually inside a closet on the right side of the wall. So I'm trying to find my way going like this, and there's a wall here, and there's a wall here. I go like, this does not make sense. <laughs> like, and then I go out, and I try a new bearing, and I try again, and I end up like this, that's the way, and I go like this, and I start drifting again. I end up like in cupboards. So I feel the wall here, I feel a wall here, but something open here. I don't know where I am because I'm going through different type of cupboards. So anyway, the only, the only good thing about this is when I walked around like this, I knocked down all the cameras. So there's no, <laughs> <laughs> there's no proof that this ever happened. And I will kill anyone who knows about it. Um, no, but it, it, was, it was part of, it, one, one of just many lessons is that it's, it's hard, like it's hard. It's hard to move with a straight, like a straight stream, just get in the right direction. It's hard to, even if you flow, take your bearing, go forward two meters and then still flow again. And that will have new complicated because now we have a time problem. If you wait too long, you're back at zero again. Like you have a time problem, which is why the the the, the work how we work between one and two is very important. And it changes if you switch to straight stream, for instance. Like the how one and two works together is like massively different. Uh, but it's the same with fog. Like you see, it's it's complicated. It's complicated 
regardless of whatever you do. But I just find the second part of the question, straight stream has less problems with, with usage than fog has. And my experience is getting to that apartment and then switching and having firefighters in zero visibility, knowing that you're actually inside the compartment, switching to fog, finding the right pattern. While you have found the right pattern, you have long before just <laughs> and done. It, it would, yes, definitely. Fail-proof is a great word. It's much more fail-proof in my, my sense. Doesn't mean that it doesn't have possible fails. You need a ceiling. <laughs> like if you have a flame here and you don't have a ceiling, you, keep, like you just go straight through. Like you have to have a surface to break the stream. That's just that's one of the... Like, like if you have a very high ceiling, as high as you can go, it's like you can't. You would just lob it through it and nothing happens. I think you were first. Okay, thank you. Uh, have uh, you or Thais any experience, not from the study, because from the real training, in a combination about uh, the, the flow and move, like uh, next to the, to the uh, impulse? What I think is, in the real flats, the hallway is not 17 meters long. It's like you're... Uh, kitchen fire, yeah. maybe five meters, and you have to go left or right to the fire room. And when you enter the, uh, the flat, start with one arc, and then move forward to the fire room door, and then you do it again. Yeah. Have anyone experience with the, not, not with the fluid loaf, about the whole distance? I would say that's the, that's the baseline for what I teach. It, it, is, it is not flow continuously, because <laughs> most fires are not that bad. <laughs> like, most fires are pretty reasonable <laughs> fires, they're pretty small. So you, for instance, if, it, like the most, if I were to teach the most basic and simple one, and if they have a thermal imager, it would be if you have a FLIR camera and you look into the hallway and you see gray, you don't cool, but then you advance two meters and you check again, like because if you don't, if you only see gray, it's not very hot. And it doesn't really m make a much of a difference. <coughs> right, okay, so if you see yellow, then you do an arc, and then you advance two meters, and you look again. And you see yellow again, you do another arc, and you advance. And if you see red, then you can start maybe if you see red in the camera because it indicates like five, six hundred degrees actual flame and combustion. Then you maybe can start to think about should I try to and cool. <laughs> yeah, but. To me, to me, it's one of the, one of the valuable things I, I learned was first I had a, a sort of when I again when I try to I wouldn't say dumb it down I say simplify because that's what we need to do to firefighters we need to simplify. When I try to simplify and say that okay as so soon as you you stop seeing yellow in that case you can advance. The problem is of course time. If you cool and you take up a tick it's yellow again, like it because you have a time problem it it will rebound it will come back. So in that case, you will just sit in one place to cool, put it down, cool, put it down. So what I teach is, if you see yellow, for instance, or if you see, if you think that it's sort of half hot, you cool with an arc, then you advance two meters. If when you cooled, because that's the corporation one and two, and I, I, when I teach, the number two is always sitting holding camera for number one, so number one can see what's happening. So you cool, and if you see any, like it, it becomes gray. Now you know that you're, you're stronger than whatever fire it is, and you can advance two meters until you do it again. Like, you need to see that sudden improvement that's one second long. That's all you need. Now I know I'm stronger than the fire. If you're cooling and you don't see any improvement, it's still yellow. Now something is wrong and you shouldn't advance. So I, it's not continue. It's what I, I describe it as temporary improvement to know that you can safely advance. That would be... So again, I think the, the ventilation factor is key over here. So if you have a, a large enough fire load and you're in a situation where the ventilation is uh, limited, yeah, then stop and flow has a lot of uh, yeah uh, good things because uh, there isn't such an amount of energy being released from the fire. If there is uh, a lot of holes in the building and uh, we still have to get uh, to the seat of the fire, yeah, then uh, keep the nozzle open, I think. Yeah. And it, it's the same with the story of Lars. 
Oh. Uh, <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Oh. <laughs> well, that doesn't matter. Uh, well, yes, and I agree. So, and, and that would be the, the baseline for most firefighting at least in Sweden. I think the same here. Like, we don't have like massive ventilated structures. It's, it's one window gone at most, those are on bedroom on fire. Then stop and, stop and flow and advance would be far more than we need. It's just a simpler with a straight stream rather than a, than a fog. Now, could you do continuous fog going like this? Sure you can. If you, if you have an open, opening that's big enough for, for discharging all that pressure you're creating in front of you, you would just push everything forward. Yeah, I was just, yeah. Yeah, that's what I put, uh, that was going to put the yeah. twist. Hey, is there any, like, steam or rescue or whatever? It, what, is there any question left that you? There's so many things that we haven't covered. Feel free to shoot. Now's your chance. I will. I will. Uh, then I will. Do I have? No, I don't have any time. <laughs> 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 I have some things I would like you to research, but I can take that with you. <laughs> do I have one minute? Uh, yeah, yeah, you have one. Yeah. Uh, no, but there is. There is. First off, I think this. This is a cri critical factor to understand. And it sort of doesn't exist. It's just in my head it exists. How important mixing is. So if we take a space and we want to cool that space, it's an erroneous, erroneous. It's wrong to think that you should always cover the smoke with droplets. It's that the smoke should get back to the droplet. Okay, so if we have a space like this, which is fairly large, and we want to cool it, we have to be inside it to, to hit every surface. We need to like, guide the stream. But if we're a piece out of it, we can't hit all the surfaces. If we're just two meters out of it, we can't, hit, we, we can't get the angle to, to get well, droplets everywhere. You don't have to. Or if you use, like this case, it's, a, it's a just a fog nail. So if we have smoke over here, we put a fog nail here, you will see the fog nail come in here. Droplets are only a partial piece of that, but the overpressure will push everything back here, the underpressure here, and you will have rotation of the space. So a volume of that size, you would rotate with the fog nail within five, ten seconds. So you mean that you get the smoke to travel back to the droplet rather than the droplet travel to where the smoke is, because droplets don't travel. This is a key concept to understand because it relates to transitional attack. It everything you're doing in the hallway, you don't have the angle to cover the space. If you just create rotation of the space, you will rotate the smoke back. Now, the downside, of course, is that you rotate the space. Whatever, it whatever is in the ceiling, we get to the b bottom. You don't have any visibility. If there's tox toxic gases in the ceiling, they will come down. But that's sort of part of it. Like, we can't really avoid that. It's sort of just a necessary evil. We just want to be quick to get to that position when everything is mixed to open up the door, get everything out. So mixing of this, this is, this is, doesn't, this doesn't exist in any paper <laughs> that this, well, yeah, but because if you're inside, you can move your stream around and cover everything, but it's still not, you don't have to. If you, if you position yourself in this hallway, you took a, a fog, you go this, you will suck everything here. It would just take 10 seconds, but in that case, you could just move your stream around. But if you have a fog nail or a, or, or a, or a cobra or something like that, you don't have that option. But also, again, angle. If you're outside in the hallway, you don't have an angle besides this or a transitional. You can't switch to cover droplets. I want you to cover this. Okay, uh, more things, but I don't have time. Okay? Thank you, Thais, for your presentations. Uh, so I hope that you enjoyed it. Uh, there are more people than we expected, so apparently uh, some uh, people were inspired to come here. And uh, I hope that you can use all this knowledge in practice. I We'll be here uh, next uh, day, so uh, please feel free to ask us any more questions uh, uh, tomorrow or this afternoon. And if you have questions after the break, we will do it again. Yeah. It, may, it, it probably would be different, but yeah, yeah, <laughs> similar, similar but different. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.